So You Can Play That Game is proudly sponsored by NiceGameShop.com. The place to go for rare and unusual Asian games. Okay, so one of the, um, the, the sort of key motivations for doing this the second time, not just kind of for the sake of seeing uh, you know, all friends of you again, but um, was to start off the process of forming this organisation, which I talked about kind of very briefly throughout the day, um, which kind of for now called the uh, UK Tabletop Games Association. Essentially, a trade organising body within the UK to help organise between ourselves as, as business owners, as project owners throughout the country, um, or as service providers within that industry. Whether you're reviewers, or um, you know, you might be a, a designer uh, that doesn't publish themselves, wants to connect better with the publishers through something like tabletop generation uh, or elsewhere. Um, and you might be an illustrator, a graphic designer, you might be a composer. Um, you might be a, a video animator. Um, there are loads of different uh, ways that you might get into the industry somehow, and lots of types of people in different areas that want to get together. One of the difficulties that, that I had starting up um, over the last sort of, couple of years, and a lot of the difficulties that a lot of the others in the room have had who've had the same sort of experience, is that there aren't that many places where you know that exists when you start off, where you know you're going to get the answers to those questions you need. Now, I mean, since I've been doing you know, the, the UK Tabletop Kickstarters group for the past like, year or so, and that's been really good. Right? There's a Facebook group basically to help people chat through ideas, through concepts, you know, check off a, a Kickstarter page and see if it, it makes sense or not. Uh, and that's been a really useful resource, but there could be more. You know, there could be there could be central resources where they're all in one place. We, we know where they are. There could be services that could be provided to newcomers to the industry. For example, having a graphic designer that you know is always there and can do stuff at a set rate. Graphic designers are relatively expensive, and knowing what they are, when knowing what those prices are in advance, and knowing what the ballpark is, and knowing you're not being screwed by someone random on the internet is a really valuable thing. Like I've been burned a couple of times by illustrators in the early days by not setting the prices well enough, by not setting expectations well enough. Knowing what all those different parameters size is an absolute minefield. And you know, we've all basically reinvented the wheel like a dozen times between us because we've all done the same problems and had the same issues and the same experiences and then had to fix them in some way. But why we've done that is basically because we haven't communicated with each other because we didn't know each other existed in the first place. Now we get you, now everyone in the room and lots of people outside in the, in the rest of the country know that there is such a massive industry in the UK. There's tons of shops, like you guys, doing their thing. There's loads of publishers that are growing out of the woodwork, loads of independent designers, playtesters, and all these uh, other sort of creatives in there as well. So the, the <coughs> idea is to set up this organisation as a, as a members' organisation for um, individuals that are interested in providing their services to others within that organisation or as, uh, as interested parties. Um, and then kind of, I probably can't think of a better word for it, but corporate tier, uh, corporate tier uh, membership um, for those who are looking for more business orientated uh, services from the organisation. So kind of looking for the skills that are already present in that communi community, but through a formal platform. Um, so you've got that sense of trust and that sense of expectation of, you know, you know what you're getting. So it might be uh, something like, a, I was thinking about like an in-house graphic designer, like I said, a copywriter, um, it could be a poser, a sculptor, or whatever. We have a kind of a network of people we know are good that have set rates that we can offer to the members for a set price. We can guarantee that they're available. We can vouch for their quality and their professionalism. Um, and we have central repos repositories of information on you know talking about uh, things like uh, having a network of uh, all the uh, the game stores in the UK. Knowing who they are is a bloody hard thing to do sometimes. Like, obviously, I know you two through Facebook, and I know your places exist, and I'm, I know that they're there, but there's probably dozens of other stores around the country that are maybe a bit smaller and don't have as much of a Facebook presence. Maybe their, uh, their owners aren't on some of the chat groups that we kind of you know, move, move in those circles. But knowing that they're there, they're a resource. You know, they're a place that we can sell our games, where we can test our games. They may host events that are useful to us as designers or publishers or whoever else. There might be places to do a review video for a change of scenery. Like, the, there are all those resources that aren't at the moment being utilised fully. And then I just try and connect them all together. So, that's kind of my pitch for this thing. Um, at the moment, I've got a fairly clear idea of what I think would be good. Um, but I'm one person, one company, and there's dozens out there. So, what we want to kind of do is, is kind of establish whether people think this is a good idea, whether people think this would be valuable. And if so, what kind of things would, would you know, 
Becky, what kind of things you know you would find useful? What, what, what value you could get out of this kind of organisation? What kind of information would you want to, to extract from the members and, and have in a central place? You know, that we can mount on something like tabletop generation, make it easy to access. <coughs> Um, but to have people dedicated to extracting that information, you know, what, what kind of you know, designer resources do you want, Adam, for, for helping you design your game and, and get the right materials to a publisher, for example? Um, you know, what, what kind of repository of publishers and, and game titles that are coming up within the UK might you want for, for doing video content? So it's, it's that kind of thing. But at the moment, I've only got a sense of what it could be, but I really want to get an idea from you guys what you think would be valuable. Like, if I was to go away and spend a bunch of time on this, what would you want me to do? What do you want people that I drag in to do this? How would you want the organisation to function? That's my big long-winded question. <laughs> Hopefully you have answers. I mean, it's something which I've been looking to for a while. In particular, I've been talking with Lawrence from Working Games about, about it and within a group which we started on Slack and various people have been involved in, in that. And it's been a discussion point for a while at various events as well in terms of bringing together a community See that well, there are communities like Facebook to help each other out as well. But going further than that, having a yeah. one body surrounding in which well is its own entity in a way, and there's lots of things that it, that can include. So there's the distribution uh, sort of angle in terms of creating a network and establishing relationships with the retailers, and in line with that, having PR sort of things as well, and to be able to promote and market the games to the retailers so they know exactly what's coming out, whether that be a regular ske schedule, so okay, this is the game of the week, stuff like that, uh, to really highlight the community here. Uh, you know, I've been to various events as well, like in Nuremberg, Nuremberg, and there's a huge network there, and people have realized that there's a big gap in the market here, even whether it's from the form from the publishing standpoint, there's even loads of international titles which are really great games, but they don't have distribution market here at all. It's something that the UK publishers could even jump on board with, and I know some people who have a little bit like Henry from Broken Games. He started doing that a little bit. I mean, uh, Big Potato Games they started doing that a little bit. I mean, and there's various others. I mean, Cosmos they started doing it. They're a bit bigger, but. Loads, loads of different companies are starting to get in on the small scale for the distribution and trying to tie things together on their own, and we're not doing it together. And there's a whole point about having all the resources available so people who are just starting out, whether they're small publishers, uh, lots of other things involved is making that information readily available, whether that be a main page where everything's clearly laid <coughs> out, so everything's there and not sort of spread out and scattergun everywhere. Yeah, sure. I think that's one of the kind of the, the, the key problems we have with the information does exist. Like all, all the answers to all the questions are already there, but you have to go, you know, fifty different blogs. You have to go like nine hundred different board game geek forum like pages. You have to like scour Reddit for some answer to some question that some publisher gave once, maybe. Like it, it's not it's not easy. Like you do have to put a lot of legwork in, and it's kind of unnecessary. Like, if that was in one place, that would make it so much easier. You'd save loads of time. Mm. And it would hopefully get more people into the industry. Because there are lots of good ideas out there, probably, that aren't being realised because people don't know where to find that information and being put off. Are you looking at a group that is first and foremost about um, contact information and clear, this is who does what and just a formalising of the chaotic mess that we currently have, or are you looking at something that can do all that and then attempt to achieve some goals? The latter. Right. Okay. So the, the the original kind of like idea that you know kind of like I remember talking about Lawrence with this was having some kind of like informal grouping of, of companies, whether it be publishers, retailers, designers, whoever. Um, and kind of meeting up every now and again, kind of talking through plans for things. And we kept kind of coming back to the same conversation and it never really went anywhere. And then we realized that what we actually needed after, I think it was the 2016 Expo where we had this chat. Um, and one of the key problems we came up with this was we can't get to conventions in other countries. It's bloody expensive. And one of the big things is, uh, for example, ESSA, those of you who don't know, they, they charge a co-exhibitor fee 
Now, a minimum size of stands, and if you want to share that with someone, you have to pay them 100, 150 euros or whatever it is. Which means, if you're an independent designer and you have one game, and it's, you know, because of a little podium or something, you can quite easily put it in a meter square. You can't do it unless you can manage to convince a publisher to be nice to you and give you some of that space for the appropriate amount or whatever. Um, so what we came up with was this plan to uh, get a massive stand at Essen for all the UK publishers, and it'd be the big, grandest, wonderfulest thing you could ever imagine. It'd be bigger than the Polish area, the Korean area, the Taiwanese area, whatever. And it'd be, it'd, it'd be awesome. Like, it'd, it'd be great. I mean, have loads of these, these great titles from the UK being popped into the rest of the European market. And hopefully all those distributors and retailers and, and licenses would come along to this big stand and take all of that creative energy and monetize it in their market, and then we win from that, right? Everyone has a great time with it. Uh, the difficulty was, because of this co exhibitor fee, and despite my best efforts, Mertz were like, were like absolutely having none of it when I said, I will give you like 50 businesses worth of trade as a massive essence store. All these people weren't coming, but they will do if you, if you cut this exhibitor fee for us. And they said, nope, not doing it. Um, they just absolutely flatly refused for their own reasons, and it's fair enough. But um, I had a chat with a guy from the Department for International Trade. Um, after this conversation where someone said, what about the government? I hear they have money. Um, <laughs> it turns out they, they do. Um, people have quite a lot of money, um, it turns out. Uh, thanks guys for the tax money. Um, so it turns out that um, they will uh, provide funding. It's a set amount of funding of £1,500 for European and £2,500 for uh, non-European conventions per business. Okay. How many, like, how many publishers do we have in the room? Like people self-publishing or publishing other people's games in mind, right? We've got like what, 10 maybe in, in this tiny gathering of people. That's 25 grand to go to Gen Con, right? And that's just free money. That's insane. The usual solution to this problem is to put a corridor. The Germans put it everywhere they go. You have the German corridor. When I went to South Africa, yeah. we were the only British company there. It was my whole team to the National German Rally. There were German flags, start to finish, over the central aisle, and there were only five aisles, the middle aisle, the left and the right of the aisle, German flags were every damn stand, a huge German flag. Yeah, and that, that's basically what we plan to do for Essen. The, the difficulty was that even if we all individually bought our stands, which is what a, a lot of us here have done, there's absolutely no way to guarantee that you'll be in the same place. Doubly so, because the way that Essen, Gen Con, and some of the other big conventions work is that if, say, I wanted to be next to Andrew, I can't do it, because Andrew's got better points than me and will be in the better hall. Now, interesting, no, interesting, 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 interestingly enough, because of the fact that Mertz Flag decided to rearrange Hall 3 and Hall 2, pretty well, I mean, hands up who's going to Essen, and who's in Hall 7? Because I think we all are now. I'm in Hawaii. I'm in Hawaii. Oh, right so, 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 okay, so, uh, misinformation. What's, okay. the, what's, what's the, ranking the ranking like? Uh, how does it work? You have to have gone before. Yeah, you start. Yeah. The way it works is obviously there, there is a, essentially an informal ranking of like which halls are better to be in because they're the ones at the front, so you sell more copies, then you get the big boys, so you get that kind of brand exposure as well. The way, the way I understand Merch Flag uh, Essen booking works is that if you have a stand, you get priority booking for the same stands the next year. Yep. Unless they change the rules, in which case they shove you into Hall 7. Which is what happened to Hall 7, I think. Yeah, to Hall 7 is um, the worst. And then they go to what, 2? No, Hall 7 is good now. It, it's, it's changed. It's, it's always Hall 6, this shit one. I don't know. <laughs> 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 What's the yeah, basically one of the one of the, the key things is that they don't put big stands in the R of nowhere. That is like the one rule of every convention is you would never put a big stand in a small in, in the silly place with like all the ones that you don't like. And even if <laughs> even if you did, it's still a massive stand and everyone sees it. Who saw the ITV stand at Expo? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's fucking huge. That's why. I mean. Right, that was on purpose. I pretty much burnt all my cash doing that. But it was noticeable. I was trying to test the concept. Does it actually work for a small, relatively unknown company? And it does, hands down. The difficulty with Gen Con is that they really radically limit the ability to have big stalls. Um, but at Essen, they don't. If you want to buy 300 square meters of floor space at Essen, they will give it to you. The difficulty is these extra charges that are levied on these extra people being added to. So if you just want this two meter by two meter, or meter by a meter space, you can't really do it. 
Um, so the idea is to, to access this funding, which we have to be a recognised trade organisation to get hold of. That's the, the key problem. There's a recognised sorry. trade organisation for the British Federation of Brewers. I'm going to turn to Their technique is, to, is they, knowing they will get them taken up, take all the, all the um, tools from one particular aisle and a big one at the end of it. That's theirs. And then members get to get that. Um, take on those stalls. That all always relies. Yeah. And always end up together. If we could do that, then that would be, that'd be ideal. Because we would mm -hmm. effectively get around this idea of, uh, of the kind of co exhibitor fee. The yeah. difficulty is none of the, the gaming conventions let you do that. Um, they, you know, even Expo, which are probably the friendliest big event that you'll ever find, I asked them, um, and bear in mind, like, for, for next year, we've got 150 square metres, we'll probably be the biggest stand at Expo next year. Which is kind of insane, yeah. um, but um, so, you know, so we're just a bit bigger than it this year. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that, that's going to be a big stop. Even though I may well be the biggest stand there, I don't get to choose where I go. Like, given that I'm giving them thousands and thousands of pounds and probably one of their biggest customers, but I don't because obviously the logistics of doing that kind of are insane, that, and they don't standardise the sizes. It's not like they have like a size A, a size B, and a size C stand because it's, it's not feasible for the kind of stuff you do. That you can't, unless you have this like co exhibitor fee thing, you can't really dictate to the, the organizer of the event where individual independent stands will, will be organized. So, they would be ideal to, to organize, you know, kind of UK corridor or a UK kind of area in, in something like Essen or Gen Con. They just don't let you do it because they, they've got their own interests. Well, they do let you select your quadrant or? Yeah, you can have a general area, um, but there's no way of actually like, fitting them next to each other. Uh, or, I'm guaranteeing that that's the case. So, so Peter, if you. I mean, I know you went through all the numbers, but if you if you took the big stand and paid the co-exhibitor fee, yeah, as opposed to took the number of small stands that would have ended up, what was the difference in cost? Well, the, the, the difference was specifically 150 euros per additional person. But presumably, a bigger stand is cheaper than the other. Absolutely, that's the difference. So you pay for the small There are no conventions that will give you discounts. The only exception to that is Expo if you give them an absolutely fat stacks of cash for some things and then they just add a little bit on in terms of they might add an extra feature, then no one will give you discounts. Right. Um, and because obviously they make their money on the square footage, right? They, they have to pay per square foot to the convention centre, so that there's no way of them feasibly being able to kind of pass on a saving to, to exhibitors. Would it be possible to have like say one business represent lots where they just um, demo lots of people's different games. I've done this. No, you still get charged. You get slammed. I asked the same question because I, th I thought that might be a way around it. Particularly if we were demoing a game for someone, you know, it might be that you, know, you bring your game and you can't get there for some reason. You're a wedding or a holiday or something. You're like, hey, ITB, can you demo my game and have a stand there? And I asked that, and they literally said, like, no, we will give you the extra charge because you're representing another business entity or another person. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure we're going to get very far in solving the convention no, sure. issue. <laughs> so can we just go back to the the trade body mm -hmm. and UKTI and Baze or whoever? What exactly are their criteria for it to be a our uh, trade body that they will then give us money for as publishers? So um, the the word they used was it has been an approved trade organisation, um, and they like it's it sounds kind of insane uh, what what this actually is, but if we, so if we in this room um, decided, right, we're going we're gonna to make this organisation, it doesn't currently exist, I checked. Um, if it did, then we'd have to, there's all sorts of weird legal stuff around that, but because this kind of thing doesn't already exist, all we have to do is set up a bank account. That's the only thing we have to do to be a trade organisation. The approved part is different. Then we have to go that approach, reapproach the, the contact at uh, DTI and be like, or DIT even, and then say, okay, we've started the organisation on your instruction to access this funding. Now, we basically go along as a pack, so rather than me just going, oh, I, I know some other people who may be from the NSA, <laughs> but I, I, don't, I know a guy who knows a guy, like, it's, there, ha there has to be a, a formalised, legally binding thing. Um, you set up a community um, organisation bank account, just like a, a regular like, you know, you might do for a club or a church group or something like that. Um, and you, you nominate a president, a secretary, a treasurer, that's a minimum legal requirement for setting up that organisation. You do not have to have anything other than a couple of members. I think it's like 25 members or something like that, which 
it's pretty much the rules. I think we covered that. Um, but then what you have to do is go back to the department and say, okay, we have this formalized setup. We've got buy-in from independent organizations that have decided that we're going to do this. And then you go through their kind of approval process, which is basically to make sure that you're not bullshitting, that you have actually got genuine business entities with registration numbers. So getting everyone's like company's house number, for example, and making sure these are real businesses, um, it isn't just some weird shell scheme that you're trying to access funding for some other bullshit, um, is actually a proper thing. Um, at that point, they give you approved trade organization status within the department and for other government bodies that are related to it. At that point, we are now recognized by the government as a thing, um, <laughs> as, a, as a, the trade organization for our niche in our industry, so you know, TikTok games, basically. Um, as we define it, um, to get funding for the conventions, and I would imagine for the funding for, for other things from other government departments, we, we then have to basically lobby them to get our convention on a special list. At the moment, I checked again, like Essen and Gen Con are not on those lists because they have no idea about board games being a thing. Nuremberg is. So if we wanted to go to Nuremberg with some people and do that, the you know, biggest toy game fair in the world kind of thing, we could do that. It's not that great for board games, as far as I know, um, compared to obviously Essen or Gen Con, but they do have that reference point. And, and actually some of us are more actually into that wider retail toy market. Yeah, it's exactly. um, that so hobby it, game. It market, would definitely so. be worth doing just from that perspective. Um, but for the for the hobby game market, we need to be at Essen and Gen Con. And to get that funding, we need to there's like a yearly review of this list of conventions which they will happily give us money to. Uh, once you're on that list, you get the money. Um, or you, you can have it if you ask for it. Um, and to do that, we have to basically, you know, one representative from this hypothetical organization would represent all of the members. So it might be a hundred constituent businesses. And then at that point, they take you seriously because obviously you're representing a hundred large amount of taxpaying entities. And they, you know, they want to increase the amount of business that you do elsewhere. Um, and then you get money. And then we splash the cash at, you know, getting rid of this massive co exhibitor fee for all the smaller guys. And then they get to access the sales revenue of places like S and Gen Con. That's roughly the system as far as I understand it. Just to be clear, though, this is it's not just about the money. No. Because an organization like this, and in our discussion before, it's about professionalizing and trying to raise the standard and quality of the of the entities involved and the way they conduct business. Yeah. Exactly. So that they're taking that much more seriously. And yeah. It opens a lot more doors and opportunities for. Exactly, yeah. I mean, like, particularly, you know, I mean, we kind of know this kind of intuitively, like the German and American markets, they know their shit. They got, they got their shit together. Like, they, they've got the distribution networks sorted, their mental networks are sorted. Indie games are doing all right. You know, they're definitely making some money, but, like, realistically, it's the big companies, the big boys, they're making, making the money. So, so back to your original point about resources, so that's, that's kind of part of the engine room. To, yeah. to raise the game of, of the indie space. So in my mind, I'm saying you've got, you got a space for technical resources, so all around the kind of things you were mentioning. Yeah. And then there's a whole other part of it, which, which, which raises the other part of professionalism, which is the people resource, the kind of the legal support, all those kind of issues. So, so the combination of resources provides a quite a, a rich opportunity to really have that and have, and have the resources that ordinarily would not be available to very small companies. Yeah, so I mean, one of the, um, as, a, as an example, my, my business partner is a commercial lawyer who works for a big fancy city firm and he wears a suit to work. Like, that guy works on like trillion dollar contracts and stuff and it kind of terrifies me. But I can rely on him to give me like very accurate, very effective legal advice on pretty much anything I can come up with. But there's absolutely no way, no way I could afford to hire him mm -hmm. as his actual job. But as a partner in the business, I can be like, Jake, do you want to volunteer two hours any time a month just to like help some movies out with some like designer contracts? And be like, yeah, sure. Five minutes later, it's done. And it's that that kind of buy-in from people that are already within the industry and already have that technical expertise. I mean, say before to someone, there's like 50 software engineers in the like people I can think of off the top of my head. And, like those people can can write pieces of code for different platforms. They can help. You know, there's a developer sat right in front of me. <laughs> I'm sure if we came up with some kind of thing that we needed as a team or one project needed. There's going to be someone with the expertise to do it. You know, they're probably going to charge you some money for it, which is fair. But they ought not... to be charged. Yeah, I mean, they, they should. Because yeah. one of the major problems with the industry at the moment is that we do too much for free, yes. for goodwill, 
and because we're paying it forward. And that needs to, if we are forming a professional body, it needs to be professional, and one of the definitions of professional yeah, is paid for. Yeah, exactly. And it'll be um, particularly on things like, um, like illustration, graphic design, copywriting particularly. A lot of people will be like, oh, can you help me like, write this thing because you wrote a book once? That's fine up to a point, it gets the industry so far. But if we want to kind of raise the game, like you said, and get to Gen Con with a you know, thousand square meter mega stand and be like, hi guys, we're here. Yeah. And then everyone comes to the last stand because they know that's where the shit hot games are. Fuck FFG, I'll get their stuff later. I'll go to the UK stand first because I know they've got the interesting stuff. And that's where that's where the innovation happens. In the tech industry, everyone knows that already. Everyone knows that London is one of the tech capitals of the universe and you go there for interesting things. It might be the biggest, but it is one of the best. Like financial services as a, as a little thing. What we want is the same kind of attitude to British board games. We might not be the biggest market, but one of the best markets. It's where cool stuff happens. Uh, so so in games. terms of UK brand, the whole great brand, yeah, exactly. great Britain brand, but it's actually well for very well the games. Yeah, exactly. And that's a huge big export. Um, yeah. An industry that, 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 that did you call it the DIT thing? Yeah. We could switch and, and yeah, exactly. But that's what that's what they were so thinking of the Scottish yeah. say, <coughs> DIT is that England and Wales? I think that's just England and Wales. I think they, they, they do have obviously formal connections with the Scottish and Northern Irish branches as well. Yeah. Um, so I don't I think if we if we get a through trade like a trade uh, organisation status in one region, we automatically you get to the other. But you need yeah. to apply. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to do paperwork, but it's, it's yeah. relatively easy once you've got it in one of the regions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this, this okay. was not in question. Who's in? Not in question. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. 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 we've got 25 members, it's fine. So, but you call yourselves the UK Tales of Game Association. And your current brief, as I understand it, is to support independent manufacturers like yourselves, but you are the UK Tabletop Game Association, so at that point you are not claiming ownership of the UK Tabletop Games, but there is a larger sphere out there of companies who may want to join the UK Sales of Game Association yeah. and buy games to it. But they probably wouldn't because they probably not sure. they'd be welcome to. Yeah, but they probably wouldn't. But you know, it's sure. they, because they're going to workshop. But you know, you'd be surprised actually. So when the video game went set up, people yeah. thought the big video companies won't won't join in. As soon as there's free money for their twenty five pound membership, yeah. Yeah. they're there. Yeah. And, and that's what I mean, it's things like IGA, which is like a tiny thing. And then Jigamic, which is, you know, a big fuck off company. And, you know, they joined it and it's like, yeah, because they're getting shit done. Well, once the, and obviously especially for them, it's like, what's the cost of it? Oh, it's it's like two hundred pounds a year, it's like fuck all to them. Yeah, I mean like obviously the, the incentive is, is not for them to form this organisation, it's it's for small businesses and, and, and enthusiasts like us who want there to be those resources. But once they exist, once there's that structure there. If Games Workshop did sign up as a corporate member, for example, and wanted to access, you know, our kind of database of resources, whatever that might be, we've then got a line of communication with corporate at Games Workshop, and we can say, "Hey, guys, could you do me a favour?" And then they go, "Oh yeah, sure, no problem, five minutes." And that thing's worth thousands to us because it's how much there. In corporate Games Workshop. There we go. One connection, and you're ready. Um, in regards to uh, independent designers, obviously we're not self. Regulating businesses, um, how would that work if we wanted to join the? Um... So as I as I kind of I've been doing a lot of research on existing similar organisations that have like increased ministries and elsewhere. The best structure I can see at the moment is like an individual and a business membership. So you distinguish um, a service provider like a like a freelancer basically like a, like an illustrator or or a, um, or a designer like yourself from a company. Right. So I I wouldn't sign myself up. I'd sign ITV up. Right. And then we would be represented as a business within okay. that organisation um, with, a pe well, I'm paid more basically, and I get access to different things like, for example, this uh, this kind of convention, what they, um, and then, you know, Becky and Dave might be, be looking at, um, you know, accessing resources like, we talked about indie game distribution uh, between a few others, um, aggregating together the efforts of all our shipping so that Becky doesn't have to buy 12 copies of Statecraft, she can just buy one. 
um, which realistically is, is all you've got to want for, for a small game in a small region, um, and uh, making that kind of opening that avenue to people. But that's that's a business resource. That's not that's not an individual kind of resource. You'd be looking at much more like for your however many quid a year membership. You'd be looking at like okay, I've got all these like written resources, kind of guides, manuals, videos that we produce. Kind of paying for the time to put in to get that stuff there in one place. Okay. Time to put in that website to get that kind of thing. Um, whereas we'd be looking at like setting up someone to relationship manage with a, a DIT advisor um, and making sure that that line of communication is there and the money's flowing in. Um, but yeah, so that that's kind of how I imagine it being. Um, it may be over time that we have different. That we kind of split that down differently, um, depending on what the, the kind of the needs of the, the members are and who those members are. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I guess it would, it would kind of split at the moment. Okay, Peter, it feels there's quite a difference though between the the only small businesses, sole traders doing it as as a part time added interest versus larger companies, but still only a few people, but with full time employees and things. So I. I don't know how you find the right sort of model to turn over. Which, so to, to turn over would be a good good way of doing it, and that yeah. way you get your games workshops paying out a lot more than uh, I mean, it is. Yeah, I mean, like obviously, like we've done pretty well, and like it would be unreasonable for me to ask myself to pay the same amount of money as an individual designer. This is this is silly, especially when I get more out of it. I know that. And like, if we can deliver those value add services, then a business can recognise it's worth the investment. So, how, however, we work that out, and that is obviously one of the key questions: is how do we work out how much money everyone puts in to get out? Of, you know, to make sure everyone gets more than that value back out of it again, and to make sure that people are paying over the odds. Because that, like, although money obviously would have to be put into the organisation to make it function, it, it shouldn't be just for the benefit of whoever runs it. That's, that's not ideal. It needs, it needs to be a clear value add for everyone. Yeah, Mike, I think you had a question. Um, well, I was just going to emphasise the earlier point about bigger people that might be joining the organisation. Obviously, I have a slightly bigger body who the committee is. So, um, I guess the, there can be some confidence in that these big guys won't necessarily just take over straight away. Because yeah. it would be the committee that would be making the actual decision makers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, no individual member would have any particular influence. The, the, like, or at least that's, that's how we envision it. So, you, one of the things I've been looking at is, is governance. It's an absolute minefield of stuff. Um, but one of the things you can do, it's fairly straightforward, is so if you know if we define membership levels by turnover, say, and obviously Games Workshop get like <laughs> up there somewhere, and we're all like down at the bottom. Um, you know, you could define a, um, you can kind of reproportion the voting structure so that the the indie group is represented somehow. Everyone below one hundred thousand a year turnover, everyone below five hundred thousand a year turnover, something like that. Is represented by one person within the sort of central voting committee, and you know that they have just as much of a voting, voting kind of weight as the games workshops of, of the kind of the, the group to know that their interests are represented. Because um, obviously, I don't agree with that. You don't agree? You think no. we need two votes? Yeah, well, I don't <laughs> think there should be that sort of level where just because you have a bigger turnover and you have more money, you have more power in a trade association. No, what I was meaning was that you would you would categorise the groups and then each group would have, say, a single vote in, in a kind of like top tier sort of level decision making. So it might be. And it rather should be that they have a single vote, they have a board voice, but if you're going to go for something like votes, it should be. I think Peter's talking about representation on the board. So yeah. Have, yeah. yeah, we will have a retailer. We'll have a designer. We'll have a, design. yeah. Yeah. We'll have a publisher. Yeah. We'll have a massive publisher. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So it might be that um, we had someone like, maybe it may well be something like, you know, a representative from Amazon that might want to be involved. Um, I don't really know whether we want that or not, but it might be you know, someone that's a very, you know, maybe Warstones is a good example. And then someone like Becky might come along and be like, okay, we've got one person from the corporate lot. And we've got one rep person to represent the friendly local game stores. So they're <coughs> two very different things that they're selling the same product, but in a very different way and for different people. Um, so yeah, I, I, that, that kind of stuff, obviously, that, that's the kind of stuff we can spend a long time talking about. Um, but it's it's worth it's worth us thinking about it, I guess, because it, it's it's primarily in my mind, at least, an organisation to help grow the industry, and that industry is us. It's not going to workshop at the moment. Like they they have their own thing going on, and they. And like doing it, um, but realistically, we're, we're looking at trying to, like Mark was saying, professionalise the existing and currently successful indie game market, 
and to get it to a point where when that bubble maybe bursts in the future, who knows if it will, but it could do, but we're at a point where we can survive because we, we've got a chance to get up at that point. That's why where maybe there's a drop in you know Kickstarter pledges or something like that. We'll, you know the, the little guys can't do as well just on the kind of skin of teeth. Um, but we've got that infrastructure there to, to protect us and to, to kind of keep growing us. Um, yeah, uh, it's fine. I mean, my gut feeling would be that the bubble has burst because, I mean, sorry, uh, but if if you, from back in my experience of the D20 bubble, you know, the point where people in a room started imagining that there could be a bubble, the bubble had already happened and gone. Um, or at least and, was in the process of deflating. Yeah. And, and you sort of, everyone sees it like a year <coughs> past the point where where it's actually occurred. So the time for action is a year ago, definitely. But it definitely was last year, but the time for action is as soon as you can get action in place. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's I, not as bad for Kickstarters yeah, as it was for Kickstarters. I don't know kind of how Ralph feels about it. Obviously there's only a small section of the company's already. But I get the distinct impression that like people are starting to be a bit more wary. Like there's been a few few of the really big companies who've like done all right. Like CRN, obviously they have projects in the periods and everything always looks like a massive amount of money. But like looking at say Song of Ice and Fire Miniatures game, I was expecting that to get like six million, kind of a crazy, massive IP, it's a massive company, great product, and they've got like a couple. I think the point part way into the campaign where they started talking about how they never expected it to be big, did not really disperse uh, what they were saying at, at Gamma. Yeah. So, um, so just to be clear, by the bubble, are you guys talking about um, the maximum number of backers coming into yeah, a high-profile so. Kickstarter? I guess, I guess going to, there's always going to be a limit to the number of people that buy games. Obviously, that, that limit has massively expanded over the last few years. Kind of brought more people into gaming, but that, that seems to be slowing. Although it's kind of no, okay, cool. That's not right. No, no. um, that's no, that's the part no, that isn't slowing. That is the part that isn't but slowing down. More and more people are playing games. Yeah. Okay. What more and more people are not doing is backing something big and shiny on Kickstarter that they don't necessarily know is going to happen. Yeah. And what there isn't is an access route other than Kickstarter that. People who are designing something in their spare time and putting it out for access. Um, the danger is the bubble deflates. You will start to reach the point where you can produce the game. You have the money coming in to to produce stuff and get it sort of to market. But as it's deflating, the expense of doing that is either growing or staying the same but your incoming revenue may be decreasing past the point where you are making profit on it and turning it into a position where you're going to start making a loss on it. And you'll still be doing it. This is what happens with D20. You'll still be sort of doing it and putting it out because that's what your model is. And unless you start redefining how you get your products to market in an age where Kickstarter is slightly deflating, then that will soon like to catch you up because some of you are operating like a year out and a year is too long a period to not know whether you make profit or not. I mean, for context, like we like you know we had a big campaign and that was fantastic and we made a decent amount of money on that, but that was never enough to kind of go on indefinitely. Yeah. So like you know we had to I said it more staff like Anthony just got to get a pizza. Um, and like you know we we're invested in getting this place and, and getting resources to make our next game. But we have to make sure that next game succeeds as much as the existing one. And it's like, if at this point, the investment is so high to kind of keep that level up that if our next game tanks, it's probably not going to kill us. But if we don't have the backup plan, the sub terror actually getting into retail, and properly into retail, into plenty of stores in the UK, Europe, US, then we'll die. We'll just like that. that, that okay, no, I'm, 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 sorry to keep the label point, but. Essentially, it's like that's true of everybody. Yeah, it's true of the entire global market. Yeah, exactly. The global market depends on, it's like capitalism full stop. Um, <laughs> the entire global market depends on product getting to market. The product yeah. doesn't get to market. There is, a, there is a, a domino effect where the distributors go, the retailers go, you know, the manufacturers go, everyone goes because there was no 
you know, back up that. This is yeah. what virtually happens with HMV and you know, the UK media industry. I mean, from, from what you said, I mean, you're the kind of the front line of like establishing what that mainstream size of the market is. And from what you said, it's massive. It's massive. Yeah. And like, for, from my perspective as, a, as an indie publisher, trying to eek myself into that kind of pipeline, from, it, it could be said that like, it feels like it's quite small. Like if you're just looking at Kickstarter numbers, even a massive campaign, it's only a few thousand people. There are hundreds of thousands of people. Kickstarter does like. not translate uh, through to retail. Yeah. It and is a different route to market. Have you yeah, seen exactly. the rise in reprint Kickstarters? Like so you got the Gloomhaven, which was, you know, no one really knew about it until it was almost too late, and then there's more and more of these reprint Kickstarters. Because they're still so not really so taking it to retail so properly, so they're just going, let's go again. They knew about Gloomhaven yeah. in advance. Yeah, they've just got bad advice. Yeah. It says there are 25,000 pre orders in from distributors worldwide. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe from the day. They printed 2,500. Yeah, maybe one of the other ones. That would be fantastic. Yeah. That would be absolutely amazing for the fix a whole load of problems. Um, you need to implement a hammer, technically, it isn't necessarily um, true. But, I, I think um, one of the things that I found particularly useful for us, and like probably why we've done well, is having a few people that like, oh my god, pizza say, um, <laughs> have, having people that I can contact that I know nobody answers those questions. And like, if I give them the information for my project, my business, my, my thing, they're going to know how to implement that in the best possible way. Like Mark was saying, you know, we were talking earlier about um, you know, kind of changing direction for a business or kind of growing a business and like, how how do you approach that? Like I, it's hard to be objective about my own business. We're talking to someone with professional experience, and like you know, it marks a resource in this kind of organisation. Then we can go to them and say, hey, what do you think about this business plan? Can we talk to you about scenario real quickly? Just really Yeah. So I mean, so uh, for, for context, I know I've talked to you, if you talked to you like this previously. Like, and one of the things that, that we do with ITV is kind of continue on with this, you know, weird products line that we do. Um, but one of the things we want to do is prototyping. There's no point like a print on demand service in Europe, which is crazy. Why? Like that's just silly. The Game Crafter does incredibly well with the world's worst interface and it really oh, yes. me off. Yep. It's like <laughs> the worst website I've ever interacted with. How on earth are they making money? It's silly. Now if I was in the US, all I'd do is I just hire one of my simply a software engineer friends and I make something marginally better than theirs and I make an absolute packet of money. I'm not, I'm in the UK where there just happens to be just as big an audience. It's just that some of them speak German. <laughs> so all I have to do is is invest in you know the machinery, and that's where you know Sotarity and Solaris has helped us out to, to try and build that. But obviously that that's a whole different thing for me. Although I've got the ideas and the plans in place, I don't know if I'm absolutely crazy and just going to waste a lot of money. So having someone I can go to that understands the industry, understands my business, and gets it is going to be really helpful. I mean, we're talking to Mark about, about basically being you know, an advisor to help me kind of work through that process, ask the right questions, challenging me when I'm talking crap. Pizza. Um, so it, it, yes. amazing. What kind of timeline are we looking at for that post-cycle thing? Uh, about a year or so out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, just, just for your interest, I'm not sure if you're aware, but drive through RPG, uh, if you order the you know, from them, they actually ship within the UK. Yeah. They actually mm. do that for cards, because I don't think they, they are, are they are, they, they, the card site has now launched. Oh. Uh, I'm, I don't believe they're printing and shipping within Europe yet. <laughs> so it's worst interface than the game craft. Yeah, but they are massively cheaper. Yeah. 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 One of the major things I think well, is the first 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 space. But but yeah. One of the range. one of the things I've been thinking about as well, and again, this is just uh, an idea that I've had. Like, I just want this to almost be like a start of a conversation. If that makes sense. Like, I don't want to be like, "Hey, I've come up with this cool idea. Do you want to give me money?" Because that's just <laughs> not going to happen. Um, one of one of the things I've been thinking about is um, trying to work out ways that the organisation itself could generate money. So not just through membership. Um, one of the ways is to do indie game distribution. Uh, so rather than taking the colossal cut that SDVM do and like to take, and we subsidise that for indie games and give retailers the same deal they get elsewhere for anything else. And so it's the incentive then given to you to, to, to go for those games or maybe better rates than those, um, and make some money that way, generate a little bit of cash for the organisation. It would be essentially a charitable body and funding its members and the services for its members, if not a business. 
So it would get preferable tax rates, which means we don't have to charge as much. Be cool things. Uh, the other one was good games. Yeah, it's it's not charitable in the sense of like. It, it has like non profit rather than charitable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a different thing. Sorry, right, yes. Yeah. My, my problem. Um, I mean, it's, uh, sorry, I mean, you said earlier you just need a bank account. I mean, yes. Along with that, and you, a you would. Yeah, constitution. Yeah. I mean, we, we recently set up something sort of similar, which has a lot of similarities for the cycle logistics and basically bike careers. Um, and in a sense, we're competing with people like, or wanting to work with people like TNT and DHL. So again, we've got some parallels. Um, but the, we've also wanted to set up a body that would sort of help the guy who wants to start out. While well, we've also got companies that are turning over, you know, several hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And how do you sort of bring those together? Um, and one of one of the things we recognised was actually if the experience of these larger companies is made available to the little guy, they're actually putting an awful lot more in. So they, they, they potentially yeah. gain on the big scale, you know, ITV, you can imagine, would gain from going to Essen yeah. far more than, you know, some budding designer. <coughs> but actually to have a, a stock of things like contracts, you know, standard contracts, standard wording for this, standard yeah. this, this yeah. is yeah. how you can do insurance. So you just get all of that set up. Cool. It, it, that is what the little guy gets out of it. Yeah, that's the conversation Peter and I had this morning, because because I'm in the learning and development profession, and I do a lot of coaching for, for senior leaders, executives, that sort of stuff. That's not available to small business or, or women at all, really, it, 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 unless they've got a pot of money, because you've got to pay a premium. But I'll say, I've got this experience, almost 20 years doing it. I'd like to give something back. And you know what? I, I'm, I'd be happy to support people in, in the industry as a starting point. And when you become rich and famous, we'll negotiate a price. <laughs> but in the short term, give me a copy of your new game, and maybe I can give you some coaching to help you think through the challenges you're facing. Stuff like that. So, so actually, there's people in, in the industry who have these experiences. We can tie them into the resource pool. That's got to be valuable. That's got to be useful. And the, the, the thing we've done to start with, because we were looking at, okay, well, how much are we going to charge people? Does it, is it on turnover? How is it? And we just started with it. Just let's all put up an amount in. When that's exhausted, we'll be able to look and see how much of it has been spent, whether we liked the way it was spent. It saves having to set all these criteria. So not everyone can afford 200 quid. Let's just put 200 quid in, that gives us an amount. And then the, 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 you know, the, the committee has a responsibility to spend it well. If they have spent it, they can then go back to everyone and say, look, this is how we spent it. Do you like the way we spent it? If you don't, you can vote us out. You can go in on the committee, and then you can sort of move on to that sort of formalised thing that says actually now we want to charge. This is how much it will be for you, and this is. How I would much imagine that we start off with with established publishers, retailers, businesses, with kind of like a, a core group of people who would be directing with with a, you know representation for, for individual designers and other freelancers as well. We're kind of forming like the core of it, and at that point, once we know what works. Like, does it add value to retailers? Does it add value to publishers? Then we kind of bring in the fold and kind of open it more publicly. Like you were talking about, you know, kind of pushing for content first and then, and then pushing for users. And the same sort of approach where we'd be collecting together those resources and experiences and platforms. Um, and then going, hey guys, who wants in on this? Do you want a 20, 30 quid a year membership and you get to come to all this stuff and you get all these resources available to you? Um, or for your business, you want to chuck in a couple of hundred quid and get access to all this like consultancy stuff. Um, as part of your membership. Um, but yeah, that sounds like a good idea, kind of starting off at kind of a core and then kind of expanding outwards. And, and, and the point of it being a one time buy in initially was that we didn't know how much we, we, didn't know how much we were going to do in the first year. Mm -hmm. sure. So rather than saying it's going to be 100 quid a year or whatever, which is okay, everyone just put some money in. If someone new comes in, they'll put the same in until we get to the point of having spent all that and then we'll look at a sort of subscription. Mm -hmm. Does anyone here a member of? Um, Hudlum, Becky, possibly. Um, Gamma. And Stankers. Yeah, we, we're a. We're yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm having a conceptual problem with the idea of something that we've done sponsored, non profit organisation to represent an industry and then suggesting it can make a profit by competing with part of the supply chain to that industry. That seems to be an enormous conflict of interest. It wouldn't be a profit. 
So sorry, you, you said it could bring cash into the business. Yeah, the, the business unit. Yeah. There's no, yeah, so there's no, um, there's no prohibition on non-profits or yeah. charities even from generating money from not from directly from its members. So the the, the reference point I've got for that is, is I use the word for the student union at our right. university. I'm not talking legalese. I am okay. suggesting that we set up complete for a specific part of the supply chain that's critical for the industry. Yeah. We're being self-defeating. Yeah. Well, so not do we necessarily that the supply chain doesn't represent everybody. The supply chain is quite small mm -hmm. and very limited to predominantly, you know, larger games. So I think what Peter's trying to suggest is that there is a, a means of distribution to smaller companies as well. And if, if you go to a museum, they're going to have, or I don't know if they do, they might have, you know, a non-compete. At a voice point, if they do, you couldn't then supply. Yeah, the, the, you look at what's happened in the States, where as yeah. they are now only dealing with like, two distributors mm -hmm. of the five big distributors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that, that's so the way there, there, there is a there is a uh, there is a conflict of interest though, because essentially what you're suggesting in a way is a preferential distribution rate, which would distribute things cheaper than the other distributors distribute, which would mean that the distributors would not want to join a trade association. Um, and you know you're right. There is a there is a uh, a slight. I mean, the idea would be to it wouldn't be to directly compete. So well, we know that, but the point is whether or not you directly compete is is you know if there's a limited pool of cash, you're directly yeah. competing even if you're not distributing as yeah. a product. If you're it looking kind of for a service that they might otherwise have provided, yeah, which we know they won't, but. That's the, it's, it's a bit of a complicated one because it depends on what the, the definition of the market is and the the fungibility of the products. So if if you can reasonably argue that say Blood Rage is a replaceable product with say Sorterra, which it isn't. Um, who, who are you arguing with? But I mean, because the point is, well, it's not a question of arguing it because well, it there is no be. there is no organisation there is no government department that's going to criticise you for it and there's no dispute. Well, the, comp the Composition of Markets Authority would. If, if, if say, if say, oh, yeah, 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 say, say thought that our organisation was doing something that was harming its business directly, then they could make a claim to the Composition of Markets Authority that, you know, we were price fixing or something, yeah. which in this case we wouldn't be because we wouldn't be directly um, competing with them. The way I imagine that working would be that, say, so Solterra, for example, is going to the in the UK. Yeah. That means that we wouldn't sell Sorterra to retailers through any other way that, like, we wouldn't sell it through that channel that we're talking about creating. Why not? Because that would be a direct conflict of interest, because we want SDVM to be on board. If, if SDVM were open to providing the service that we're talking about, there's no reason for to have it, essentially. Did, did, don't forget, one of the reasons why you know, SDVM are working with the small publishers is because they're small. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of hassle. It is. It and admin. Is. So, yeah. in actual fact, you gain a huge amount by gathering together to create a bigger entity so that they can have one conversation and know that they're going to get a standardised product to some extent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, this, is, this is reflected in your, our conversations now with DHL, as opposed to just me and Leeds. I'm able to say, well, we can actually offer this in 20 cities across the UK. Yeah, sure. That's what you're trying to gain by... Sure, and, and I think you will not be well served by trying to set up... For all this, all, it's very easy to say they make tons of money out of distribution. Mm. If they did make tons of money out of distribution, there'd be loads of distributors. The, the point is, there's a limit. You know, Running a distribution business, there are costs and there is profit to be made. And I think if you decide that you can set that up, you're put an awful lot of effort into basically creating another distributor, yes. Yes. as opposed to negotiating with the people who are already doing it and getting better terms. But to be honest, we 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 some of us are in favour of it happening anyway. Um, it's just that there is a significant warehousing cost. There's a significant um, uh, staffing cost. We do even a, a pseudo distribution service as child housing. Um, you know, that that, yeah. that comes at a cost. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, and 
you need to probably fully cost that. Yeah. We've been talking with Games Quest about getting a, a sort of full work plan for it. And they basically said to me, like, okay, well, that sounds lovely, but we need to know numbers, which is what Sam will be doing. How many businesses is this? Can we yes, shove it in a corner? Or is it going to take up half of the new warehouse kind of thing? Um, if, if we could get to a point where you know, our kind of indie distribution representative went and sat down with John from Resdivian and went, okay, we've got 50 new games this quarter or something from UK people, I'm representing all the ones, here's a standardised sell sheet for every single one of them, here's the stack of prototypes, have fun. That's obviously far easier than, like you said, managing like 50 individual relationships with 50 small right people when you just have one conversation and go, well, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, these quantities by this time done. Like, if we could get that, that would be ideal, because obviously that's less effort and less for us. I'd imagine that that's either not going to happen or going to take a very long time to institute, mm -hmm. unless SDVL will suddenly realise that, you know, yeah, SDVL yeah. wants to come back. Yeah, they do. Yeah. 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 I, I think in the long term anyway, yeah. yeah, I think in the long term anyway, it'd be better having a separate entity focusing on providing that support and distribution network for uh, independent publishers and people who want to get more of a grounding in the UK. And there's no reason why you can't set the two up in tandem. It's no. just got one public app in the Yeah, it's a separate organisation. Uh, it, it would be, so it usually how it works is you have a, a, a charitable company or the equivalent of a non-profit. We have essentially, a, a, effectively a separate company. So it'd be like the charity, the, the way we worked out in the old, old place was you have the charity that delivered the services that had a grant from the university, and then there was a company that was owned by the charity that operated separately and kind of gave it cash. Uh, it, was, it was just another income stream. And that's basically how it worked. So the idea would be you, may, you might set up the distribution bit or whatever or business projects that the organization may want to run to fund its, its services, run completely separately, and the only input it gets is the cash. So what, yeah, so one of the things that IG in the States does is that if you're a member or a pro member, you can send in games and they guarantee to take, no matter how good or how bad your game is, they guarantee to take so many cases. Yeah. You know, uh, and they will take at least one of those games to every convention that they do and they will put it on their website. Um, so something that's a similar model, I yeah. and, and they sell those games on for, for, for a discount in the same way as a retailer would. Yeah, so they do a 50%, so they do like 50, yeah, yeah, exactly. 50% of the cost, a quarter percent to yeah. And that, that works well for them, they, they keep themselves going, and yeah. provide the service they do by doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. so I, I think we've got to be really quite careful in terms of getting into services as opposed to the staff, I think the, the, the trade, the trade, trade. <laughs> Because I think it opens up a whole load of extra complexity, and you then start having to have employees, and, and that a sudden game makes it a very different proposition. So it may be that in five years' time we might evolve into something like that. Yeah, I'm sure. That's not fair. It's a bit of time to do it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. And, and and that's why I'd say don't. Uh, there is something about. Starting off and proving the concept small, and then if it does actually have legs, yeah, the, the only reason we will be here for a long time is because no mechanism exists to get your games into into media. <coughs> yeah. So because so, if it did, then you know, I mean, call me or not, just fifty percent of its business on Kickstarter. How many of you do fifty percent of your business? But, but that's where I think. And coming on, our experts are extracting every single penny out of the Kickstarter program. Yeah. You know, so that's how much money is being left behind by not being able to get into <coughs> retail. This is this is not a thing that we can. Unfortunately, I mean, we can look at in a, a year or two years because this is this this has happened a year ago. And we are seeing the after effects of a whole lot of stuff that was happening a year ago so coming through the channel. So I totally agree that getting yeah. things into long term distribution in retail is the way to make money out of this, make a living out of it. But I, I just think running a distribution business or setting up a distribution yeah. business is in itself a big thing. 
better to partner with an established distributor, which may well not be a Stevie, I think maybe working with one of the smaller distributors who are around us. If enough people come together, the game's press don't try and promote the game. You know, it's not a distribution deal with the app. Oh, no, 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 no. Conflict of interest, but um, hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they tried to do it. I do not Just because want to buy from someone who is selling to the public. I have stopped having business relations with this. I make exceptions for actual designers because they're not in distribution and they're selling to fund. There are, I think, currently five people I will not deal with in the UK because they sell direct to my, what would be my customers. Um, and yeah, I'm afraid Games Quest is one of them. Coil and Spring? There are some on this show. I mean, there's a big island, it's in every, it's in pretty much every game store, so they've got the access. Coiled Spring has just yeah. got yellow. Coiled Spring would love to do this. My personal <laughs> estimation is that Roger is not up to the task. The problem with Coiled Spring is they don't really know what they've got. Um, I mean, not in terms of. So I'm going to digress it a bit, but um, you know, it, it's like they don't have the network of game stores that Becky and I deal with. You know, they're hardly any. That's partially why they wanted yellow was to try and build yeah, that side. Yeah, they've got a bit of a mismatch as well. Yeah. 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 They've got some talisman, they've got talisman and no yeah. stores. Yeah. I mean, how, what, what a mismatch. Are they trying to get stores? Are they yeah. promoting to us? No, they're not. Hence, don't think Roger's quite up to it. <laughs> yeah. I think now yeah. because the piece is getting a bit cold. So <laughs> yeah. Can we just say, can we say, I think everybody seems to be in agreement that something needs done. Yeah. So the final, the final question would be, where do we go from here? Can we just get that trade Think about the open pizza and <laughs> trade room and going. Yeah. Before, before, so, before, 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 before we chop the triangle, my, my current plan is to, I have a draft constitution which I'm in the process of writing mm -hmm. uh, as a starting point. Um, it's based on say, like similar organisations, similar things. I've done a bit of this kind of stuff before, so I'm kind of using my experience. Um, what I'll then do is I'll send it to everyone. So it'll, I'll put it on the UKTL.kickstarters group, I'll send it around all the emails that everyone's going to see here, any other interested party you start it off. And then I'll set up a Google Doc, and everyone will come and suggest that access to it, and then we'll go to town on it and go, this is a shit idea, this is a great idea, why aren't we doing this, what about this? And then from that point we'll get them better. Because the immediate thing would help, I think, all of us would be access to those of us to get the check on. Yeah. It really would. You know, America is just waiting and I can't. Money. Is it worthwhile once you've done the document to uh, set up in a way of it? Rather than have everybody come together and that way people can just.